Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to our webinar. I am Michelle Weiss. I am the chair of the tax section and I want to welcome you to our program on proposed regulations issued by the U.S. Department of the Treasury requiring disclosure of beneficial ownership of existing and newly formed closely held legal entities. Uh, this is a tax section program that's also co-sponsored by the business law section. Um, but before we begin the program, I want to just mention some housekeeping details. Uh, you will receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Please take a moment to complete the survey that is included with your certificate. Uh, the tax section is sponsored by the tax firm of Hockman, Salkin, Tasha, Perez, PC. The, fir the Hockman, Salkin, Tasha, Perez, PC firm Advantage is experience, an eye for innovation, and a genuine dedication to clients, their families, and their business. In addition to their national practice in civil tax and criminal tax controversies and uh, litigation in federal and state courts, the firm is also active and successful in handling non-tax matters such as business and estate planning for high net worth individuals and closely help businesses together with white collar defense and commercial di disputes. And we thank them for their perennial sponsorship of this section. Now we're gonna go on to the program. I will briefly introduce our speakers and then I will hand it off to them. Um, all of our speakers are very experienced tax attorneys. Uh, Bill Norman is a partner of the Southern California tax law firm of Norman and Zach. He's a certified specialist in taxation law and he's admitted to practice to law in the, in the states of California and Wyoming. He has been practicing tax law for over 40 years, and he has a specialty in working on uh, complex cross-border uh, uh, transactions. Our other speaker, and all of our speakers are California uh, specialists. Um, Steve Mahaley is a certified specialist in taxation law, and he's also a certified specialist in estate planning, probate, and trust law. He has been specializing in the field of domestic and international business and tax law for more than 35 years. He has been a member of international firms, accounting firms, and boutique tax law firms, and he represents domestic and farm privately held U.S. companies and high net worth U.S. and foreign clients and their families in outbound and inbound transactions. He also works on estate planning and success, estate and succession uh, planning matters. I also want to introduce Howard Fisher. Howard is also a California board certified tax specialist, and he's also a member of the Honorable Society of London's Inn. He studied at the American College in Paris and received his bachelor's degree from the University of Southern California. He graduated with honors. Um, he has a degree from Cambridge in England, and he also um, so he specializes in representing wealthy entrepreneurs and their families. His practice includes tax planning, business and commercial transactions, real estate transactions, trust and state litigation, and tax controversy. And with that, I'd like to hand it back to the panel. Uh, we have a large group today and a lot of material to cover. So we're gonna ask you to put your questions into the Q&A and we will try to answer them by the end of the program. If they don't get answered, of course, you are welcome to reach out to any of the panelists for your questions. Okay, Bill, take us away. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So what we're going to talk about today is in regulations that were issued under, uh, proposed regulations were issued under the uh, Corporate Transparency Act, which was passed uh, early this year. Um, the uh, the actual agency that's issuing these regulations is FinCEN, which stands for Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is part of the Depart U.S. Department of Treasury. Uh, these, uh, the statute and these implementing regulations uh, will require reporting by individuals who have beneficial ownership interest in uh, reporting companies or exercise substantial control over reporting companies. And these are legal entities uh, that were either formed under state law or under foreign law and registered in a state in the United States, either before the effective date of these regulations or on or after. Um, and we also have reporting by individuals who caused these um, domestic entities to be organized or to, to cause the foreign uh, entities to be, uh, to be registered. Let's just move to the agenda briefly here what we're going to cover. Next slide there. Uh, I'm not going to read through the uh, 
through the agenda, but uh, uh, we're basically going to deal a little bit with the background of this legislation and the public policy, then get right into it. What's, what reports are required? Uh, who are reporting companies? Uh, what's the form and manner of the reporting? Uh, what's going to happen to this information? Uh, and uh, then we'll talk about some planning for the future. So let's uh, go to the next slide. I put up here, and, and this slide is a little bit of the legislative and regulatory history. Uh, so if you want to trace this through, uh, you're able to do that. What we're dealing with is the item, Hi, Leo. At, item at the very bottom, which is this notice of proposed rule making, which came out December 8th uh, of, of, of now last year. Uh, in the Federal Register citation, you can see there. Um, the um, the, po the uh, public, pop public policy purpose that's being served by these uh, uh, regulations uh, is described in the next slide. I won't read it through there, but basically it's to, it's to collect information for law enforcement and intelligence agencies with respect to uh, uh, money laundering, terrorist activity and, and tax violations. Um, Howard's going to talk about a little bit the uh, kind of history of disclosure uh, initiatives both in the U.S. prior to this um, act we got this year uh, and in other countries. So Howard, um, maybe you want to take it over for a moment. Howard's materials, by the way, that relate to this are in the back of the slides. Starting in the 70s, we saw a series of acts, the Bank Secrecy Act, uh, the Department of Commerce had its uh, benchmark studies, and we had a file of something called the BE form and a FEDA, Agricultural Foreign Investment Disclosure Act, which required disclosure of properties that were two acres or more with more than $5,000 in, in agricultural products. And you say, well, it doesn't impact most of my clients because they're not farmers. However, the Beverly Hilton or the Beverly Hills Hotel, both would meet those definitions. So it was very broad and all of those required know your customer, know the client and required reporting through various levels. Sometimes it was only three levels, but sometimes it went to the ultimate beneficial owner. Starting in the 90s, the OECD had a big push to try and close down the so-called tax havens, and they came out with a blacklist initially of about 36 countries. And to get off the blacklist, you had to have a registry of who the owners are of the companies. That was quickly followed up by a series of anti-money laundering directives in the European Union. In particular, the third and fourth uh, directives were rather nasty because one, they made tax a predicate crime. Two, they required all individuals who were advising clients, including lawyers, to inform on their clients if they became aware of illegal activities. And three, they could not tell the client they're reporting. So for example, if a client came to you and said, I hadn't filed tax returns in two years or three years, what should I do? You would have to turn that client in without informing the client. The US has been dragging its feet in enacting legislation that would create these sort of databases. Throughout most of Europe, they have them. Uh, the UK has one and has had it since 2016. Uh, in the uh, UK in 2023, the British Overseas Territories are going to be having uh, directories of the ultimate beneficial owners of the companies. So this is nothing new. We tried to do this in 2017 in the US, and it went nowhere until uh, Bill will talk about how this law ultimately got snuck in in the US. The EU continues to press um, for disclosures uh, they recently, uh, at the end of the year, came out with some new protocols to attack uh, shelf companies. But interestingly, in Europe, they have uh, great concern over privacy rights. And databases similar to this, what the U.S. is trying to create, that are an Interpol, have now been required to be deleted unless they relate to an active investigation. 
So the disclosure concept is here to stay, no matter what the preamble to the regs or statute says, they're clearly focusing on tax issues. A lot of this was driven by the Panama Papers disclosures and other subsequent uh, disclosures of offshore entities. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Let's go to the, uh, the next slide here. <clears throat> Just put together a, a little slide here why uh, lawyers who uh, form or maintain legal entities for their clients, uh, or even for themselves, uh, should be interested in this material. Um, first, uh, when the regulations bec become effective, uh, which we're, we're projecting uh, next year, uh, though it could be earlier, uh, existing legal entities will that requirements uh, will have an obligation to report beneficial ownership and control. Newly formed entities on or after, effective, I should say on or after, uh, may have an obligation to report, again, if they meet the requirements and are not exempt. All legal entities that have an, obliga have an obligation to correct or update information that's previously been reported, so if there's a change in ownership, somebody dies, uh, there's inheritance, these kinds of things, there's requirements to report. And there's civil and criminal penalties, which we'll talk about at the very end here, are imposed on responsible persons who were uh, willful non-compliance. And uh, if you want to comment on these proposed regulations, uh, those comments are due on or before February 7th, uh, just a you know, short month away, if, if you will. But let's look at uh, who's required to report. Um, and we're going to start first with the deadlines, because I think Although that's usually something we do after we talk about you know who reports, but I think the deadlines are so uh, short and the windows are so short that we should just focus on this first. So if you have a domestic reporting entity that's formed on or after the effective date of these regulations, you have 14 days uh, after the date of formation uh, to file a report. And we'll talk about it at the end, and you know that's a, well, that's a practical number. Of days. If you have a foreign report entity that qualifies to do business by essentially registering with the Secretary of State, and again you have 14 days. Um, in the case of, of domestic entities that were created before the effective date, of these regulations, which are everything you have in your, you know, all your clients you have in your inventory um, of clients. They're required to report no later than one year after the effective date of the regulations. So just you know, think about how many companies you've formed and, uh, uh, and how you're going to get notices out to the clients and be sure that they do this uh, within the effective within the, uh, the period. You've got a foreign reporting entity. It's again one year from the effective date of the, of the regulation. This is the date um, of, of, of the foreign, re foreign report entities that are already in existence uh, by the time the regulations are. Uh, or issue. Go to the next one here. If you have one that no longer meets an exemption, we'll talk about those exemptions. There's 23 exemptions in the statute and carried forward to regulations. Then you have 30 days to correct that. Um, if you've got one that uh, uh, has a change of information, uh, it's again a 30 day period, including, as I mentioned down here at the end, where an individual owner beneficial owner, which can, not, can be an indirect owner, uh, dies. Um, so the next one here, um, it's another 14 days if, you, if there's a correction. This is from the date that, that the company becomes aware uh, that the information they previously reported is inaccurate. There's a special 90 day after the date of the initial report to correct. Uh, so 14 becomes 90 uh, if, you, if the uh, errors or inaccuracy is discovered within that 90 day period and, and you file a reporting period, reporting the uh, report that's required to correct the, um, the previously filed incorrect report. Otherwise you just have 14 days to correct from the date of, uh, of discovery. Going to the next one here, what are domestic reporting corporations? This is the kind of a key provision and we'll deal with this in some detail and Howard will pick this up uh, shortly. It's any corporation, uh, domestic corporation, any limited liability company, and then or other entity created by filing a document with the Secretary of State or similar office. 
uh, of, a, of, a, of a state, of any state. Uh, and we've got some little questions here we'll deal with, which is the business trust. Uh, if a business trust is required to file a, a, a document with the, with, the, with the Secretary of State, uh, then that's going to be a reported entity. I looked up Massachusetts Business Trust. There seems to be a requirement to file. Uh, you can have a common law business trust in California. I think that's not required to file. If you have a foreign uh, business trust, the statute, the corporation statute, treats that as a foreign corporation, which then would require that it filed um, if it's doing business in California. Uh, you've got testamentary trust, general partnerships, uh, associations, I think generally they would not be uh, required to file any document, therefore they would not be reporting entities. So the next slide, please. Now, what's a foreign reporting entity? Um, here we're talking about a, a limited liability or other entity formed under a foreign country law and registered to do business in any state by filing a document, again, with the Secretary of State. <laughs> And then uh, there's a question here about what, you know, what foreign entities are required to, uh, to follow your business. Well, it's clearly a foreign corporation. Um, so you're going to have a state by state analysis because it's, it's reported in any state. You can have an entity that maybe is not required to file in or a foreign country entity, not required to file in California. But if it's doing business in some other state and required to file, uh, then that would become a foreign report entity. So you can't, you can't just look at California alone. Okay, the exemptions now Howard will pick up uh, because uh, we've got 23 of them here, but they're in most situations, it's a fairly limited class that's gonna be important to, uh, uh, to most of us uh, in, practicing here in Southern California. There are two big categories of exemptions. The long laundry list of about 23 entities really are organizations that are governed and are reporting to various federal agencies, be it the controller of the currency, the Securities and Exchange Commission, or some other governmental agency. So that's why you pick up your public companies, you pick up registered public accounting firms that <laughs> are registered under Say Barnes Oxley, um, you pick up your public companies, uh, investment advisors who are registered under the uh, 40 Act, securities brokers, et cetera. Large companies, this is one that may apply to more of our clients, is large operating companies. You need 20 full-time employees, and it's not FTE equivalents. So you could have 500 people working 20 hours, and they're not full-time you don't meet the test. You need but by the way, Howard, that full time is defined as 30 hours per week. And I think it's 1300 per year. So maybe there'll be a change there. Um, of course, in California, now everybody's an employee because of the ABC test. Uh, you have to have a physical operating presence and you have to have a filed tax return for a prior year showing $5,000 in gross receipts. Well, this may be very helpful for existing companies on the initial registration, but the date for testing is the date you file with the Secretary of State. So my client has arranged for $100 million financing from a venture capital fund to start up a company on day one, we file with the Secretary of State. On day two, we open up a bank account and get $100 million. And within a few weeks, we may even have a pre-hired workforce. We don't qualify because the test will be the date you filed. So you'll end up with an initial filing for this very large company. And then when it's matures and you have one year of tax returns under your belt, I guess you'll file again and say no longer. So there's going to be a lot of problems. Um, Bill, are you going to be talking about the $45? 
<laughs> yeah, okay. we all will be. <laughs> all right. And you know, so I, for the audience, that that means that the uh, what I was referring to is the is there's an estimate of the cost of complying with this provision, and it's uh, supposed to be forty five dollars per report. So. Yeah, that's a, bit, a joke. In the first year of reporting, they're expecting thirty million hours in compliance time. Thirty million hours, and yet they figure that it's only going to take forty five dollars worth of compensation to pay somebody for one of these reports. Yeah, 30 million entities. So it's, it's an hour each. Um, should I go to the next now, slide? One quick point. There will be ways, or there's some gaps here, some loopholes. If you have a New York corporation that's making a loan to California and it's secured real property, there's a specific exemption, for example, from requiring it to do business in California to register. Now, a beneficial ownership interest will include things like uh, shared appreciation mortgages, loans with equity kickers. However, if you have a New York company that has an equity kicker type loan to California, it's not going to be a um, Sure, it's not going to be a um, an ownership interest in a reporting entity. So if New York Co. makes a loan to California Co., New York Co. doesn't have to register, although it has a substantial interest, unless it controls indirectly, even if it does, it's not going to end up being required to report because the entity itself is not report a reportable entity. Yeah, we're going to get to that as part of the discussion now. Ben who is a beneficial owner? Okay, so back to you guys. Oh, also exempt from reporting. I guess it comes under all of this. Uh, children, but the parents have to uh, report. Uh, if somebody has minor control, because they're an employee, not an officer, they're going to be exempt. Uh, charities, which includes probably pensions, uh, don't have to report either. So there's a few big ticket exemptions, but by and large, most of the clientele that we deal with as members of the bar are going to end up having to report. Um, and they're going to have to dig and get a lot of information and keep this information current. Because you could have people that are transiting in on the board, off the board, uh, their officers, and they trigger reporting. They come on, they leave. All of this will retrigger trigger these short uh, term uh, turnarounds and reports. Back to you guys. Okay. Got 30, 30 days to, to file these changes too. That's the. Right. Updated or corrected. Okay, I, I'll take it from here. Um, so who um, has to be reported by the reporting company? Well, a, every beneficial owner. And uh, this is very broadly defined. Uh, it's any individual who directly or indirectly exercises substantial control, quote unquote, over the reporting company, or who owns at least a 25% quote unquote ownership interest in the reporting company. And substantial control is, uh, there's some, uh, 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 factors in determining substantial control. One of them is if you're a senior officer of the reporting company, that's defined as a president, secretary, treasurer, CFO, general counsel, CO, et cetera, or any other officer, regardless of the official title, who performs, performs a similar function. That's the catch-all. So if you're any one of these, uh, they, you have to take a look at whether you're considered to be in substantial control and you would have to be reported on, by the reporting company on the form. Uh, and then another factor is uh, whether you have authority over the appointment or removal of any senior officer or majority uh, or dominant minority of the board of directors or similar body. So you can see that's uh, pretty broad also. And then finally, perhaps the broadest category in determining whether you have substantial control and have to be reported is whether you determine or have substantial influence, quote unquote, over 
important matters, quote unquote, affecting the reporting company. And they have a laundry list of types of quote unquote important matters. And you can see obvious ones here, sale, lease, mortgage, other transfer, principal assets, reorganization, et cetera. Uh, uh, but it gets a little bit more interesting about like compensation incentive programs for senior officers, handling significant contracts. So all of these uh, types of activities could result in um, someone being treated as a beneficial owner over the corporation. Uh, if they have uh, amendments of substantial governance documents, and significant policies or procedures. Um, Somebody and, getting paid 45 bucks for one of these reports is gonna to have to dig down to all of the company's employees, key employees, and find out if they're dealing with extensive contracts? Uh, well, that's just a factor. These are just factors. So you have to also kind of do a bit of a weighing test in determining if this third factor is enough to can be considered as being in substantial control. So uh, it could be rather uh, complex in making that determination. Uh, but yes, uh, general counsel obviously could be uh, a beneficial owner under that uh, test. And then uh, they have the catch-all again, any other form of substantial control over the reporting company. Um, and this substantial control can be exercised directly or indirectly. Uh, is very broadly defined. So um, it can be formal or informal. It can be any contract arrangement, understanding, relationship, or otherwise. So, you know, parent controlling a child, et cetera, behind the scenes. Um, uh, there's a query here whether a lender with extensive covenants might be considered to have substantial control. So there's still uh, quite a bit of questions here to be uh, answered as to, well, who really is considered to be in substantial control of a certain type of entity. Um, moving on, we have also the issue about whether you have an ownership interest in any of these entities. So any, you can see again, it's very broad, any equity interest, any profit sharing interest, any joint venture interest for voting or non-voting, capital profit interest, and Part, limited partnership or LLC, convertible interests, warrants, options, puts, calls, straddles, even debt can be recharacterized as an equity type of interest. Doesn't matter whether you're a citizen or a resident. Um, indirect ownership or control uh, also can be considered in determining whether you have an ownership interest, such as through trusts. Uh, so while trusts are not, uh, regular types of trusts are not reporting companies, quote unquote, and therefore don't have to themselves per se uh, report, uh, they could have an interest in an LLC or other type of entity, which is a reporting company. And therefore, uh, but th this is kind of a look through rule, if you will, for trusts. Uh, and so if you are a trustee and you have the dis authority to dispose of assets, then you're deemed to have indirect control. Or if you're a beneficiary of a trust who is sole permissible recipient of income and principal or, has a, or have the right to demand distribution or withdrawal of substantially all the assets, then you uh, also have indirect ownership interest in an underlying entity of the, owned by the trust. Or if you're the settler or grantor has the right to revoke or withdraw the assets directly or through intermediary entities. Or, and here's another uh, uh, catch-all, any contract arrangement, understanding, or relationship. Uh, uh, so you can see that this is very broadly defined. And while regular trusts are not, uh, again, uh, have to report as a reporting companies, they may in certain situations where they have own underlying LLCs or limited partnerships uh, or other types of entities. Um, and then with respect to the uh, other uh, test, there's a substantial control test and there's just if you own 25% ownership interest, quote unquote, uh, that's determined by aggregating all of the ownership interests that an individual owns in comparison to the undiluted ownership interest of the reporting company. So that too can get rather complicated depending upon the structure of the entity and the ownership interests. Um, then there are, uh, I think, five exceptions to uh, who is a beneficial owner and who, you know, who has to be reported on these forms by the reporting company. So minors, but of course the parent or legal guardian has to be reported in their place. 
Um, if there's any kind of intermediary nominee, custodian or agent, they don't have to be reported. But of course, the actual real party and in interest individual has to be reported. If uh, someone is just an employee and only acting as in the capacity of employee, that employee doesn't need to be, is not considered a beneficial owner unless they're a senior officer. Um, and then if you're an individual who has a future right of inheritance of an ownership interest in the entity, they don't have, they're not considered a beneficial owner until they actually inherit, until the actual estate is settled. Uh, and if you're a creditor, you're not considered a beneficial owner, but if only if you're a real uh, creditor who doesn't exercise substantial control over the entity, and he has no convertible interest or equity kicker, or that kind of thing, or conversion right. Um, so those are the exceptions to the definition of beneficial owner. The other type of person, individual, that has to be reported by the reporting company on the form uh, is a company applicant. And company applicant uh, means anyone, any individual, who filed the document that created the domestic reporting company or foreign reporting company uh, that had to you know, uh, register with the Secretary of State or a similar government official, or any individual who directed or controlled the filing of those formation documents, i.e. attorneys and, and staff, or anyone else, doesn't have to be attorneys, uh, all of those persons are quote unquote company applicants and their information has to be on the reporting company's uh, submission to the government of these be uh, benef beneficial ownership information. So this will, uh, we'll get into the implications of this, but these are the two types of individuals who have to be reported on these forms, the beneficial owners and the company applicants. And this applies to future entities and all entities going back 100 years uh, more uh, that were created in the past that are still existing. And this includes lawyers and their secretaries or assistants who sign articles. Right. We could. So what, just like they did with um, when they were trying to settle FBAR disputes, foreign bank account disputes, the government was trying to create a database of who were the bad players that assisted clients more frequently than not in strange structures. This is going to be another one of those types of databases where they're looking for the enablers, so to speak. Mm -hmm, right. And that's one of the reasons that they want this information on uh, people who were forming companies. Now, there's going to be some easy ways around this. I understand Delaware is looking at how to modify their filing procedures, including having a DocuSign feature or the equivalent so that the client could come in and do the actual signing but the lawyer uh, deposits, so to speak, the paperwork. Um, regarding the actual form that has to be submitted, it has not been uh, prepared yet a draft by the government that will be coming. In fact, two other sets of regulations will be coming. One is, I think was previously mentioned, uh, access uh, regulations regarding who can access this information. And yes, the IRS can access it and states can access it, but they have to go through a process to request it. It's going to be private and confidential otherwise. Um, financial institutions can access it. In fact, they're going to reform the know your customer rules to uh, sort of comply with these rules. Um, so what is the actual information that has to be uh, uh, reported on the initial report uh, regarding uh, beneficial owners and uh, company applicants? Well, it's pretty basic. It's the full legal name, your date of birth, the current residential address of tax residency, and uh, a unique ID number from an identifying document, i.e. a, a non-expired U.S. passport, state or local ID doc, document, uh, non-expired state driver's license, or if you don't have any of the above, uh, the prior one uh, mentioned ones, a foreign passport. And uh, also a image, that's how it's referred to in the um, regulations, which means a photograph, obviously, of the person uh, from the current 
uh, passport or driver's license or other identifying document. Um, so obviously this is gonna require extensive internal searches and uh, of obtaining clients uh, information and uh, possibly in certain cases, their permission to disclose or wait or get a waiver. Um, you don't have to provide any other information like financial details or business plans or activities. Uh, now, with respect to the um, reporting company, you also have to uh, supply their TIN and their EIN, but not with respect to the beneficial owners and the uh, company applicants, although that can be the, the, uh, the regs say that can be volunteered, or you can even apply for a so-called FinCEN identifier number, so you don't have to go through all these complications, but because uh, you've already done it through applying for this special FinCEN identifier number, uh, identifier form. Um, One of the things uh, we don't know, for example, and there's so many, uh, what if the wife, the spouse, has a community property interest? Are they going to have to be disclosed? Uh, I think so, because they would be considered a beneficial owner. Under, under state law, but not under federal law, per se. But these are the kind of crazy mm -hmm. questions that are out there. And even in the simplest example, you know, Joe forms a company. There are going to be plenty of issues. Right. Um, there are some special rules. Uh, so... Um, Miners don't have to comply with this, as I mentioned before. The tax exempt entities are largely exempt, uh, not deemed to be reporting companies, not all of them, uh, but uh, 501c3 and uh, I think Howard mentioned pensions, um, uh, foreign pooled investments. And then there's the deceased company applicant uh, special rule. So if a company applicant, i.e. a lawyer or anyone who else who formed one of these companies in the past or in the future, uh, uh, dies, and the regs have in brackets, within one year of the finalization of the regs, then you don't have to give this information. Uh, you, you have to inform the government that the company applicant has died, and you're, the reporting company is supposed to report whatever information they have at the, uh, but if they have none, then they don't have to report anything. Um, yeah, that's mentioned there. And then uh, updated or corrected reports. So um, as previously mentioned, you have to be careful whenever there's a change, you have to report uh, uh, within, uh, I think that, I forgot, is that 14 days and the correct, no, the, the change is within 30 days and the correction is within 14 days. Of, uh, of, of, the, of the event happening. So there'll be many uh, forms that will have to be submitted because there's been a change in a beneficial owner or a correction. Um, regarding the penalties for failure to uh, comply with this law, um, the, it states that it's, um, it's unlawful for any person to willfully provide or attempt to provide false or fraudulent beneficial ownership information, including false or fraudulent identifying photograph or document to FinCEN. Uh, so, and the penalties for failure to comply with the law, yeah, there's a civil penalty. So that's $500 per day and there's no cap, but the criminal penalty is $10,000, up to $10,000, and up to two years in jail. So if you think about it, $500 per day, in 30 days, you're already at $15,000. So I'm not sure how these penalties are going to be enforced. Uh, but I think the government is uh, going to want to get all the information, and uh, whether they'll be lenient remains to be seen uh, if it's... Um, regarding some uh, beneficial owner or reporting company that is not a uh, bad actor, quote unquote. Uh, so the we'll have to see in the final regulations more about how these penalties are going to be actually imposed. But right now, this is what the law says. And uh, presumably the term willful will be interpreted similar to cases that have come down regarding the failure to file five bars. 
Uh, there is a safe harbor from the uh, imposition of the civil or criminal penalties if uh, uh, the uh, reporting company has reason to believe that the report was inaccurate and they voluntarily uh, rectify the error within 90 days of having submitted the report. And um, just to finish up, um, if there's a security breach, cybersecurity breach of the database, uh, then uh, the inspector general will conduct an investigation of this cybersecurity breach. Uh, hopefully there will be no such security breach, but as we all know, um, it's not uh, beyond the realm of possibility. <clears throat> um, and uh, sec inspector general will work with the secretary of treasury uh, to provide uh, uh, the information uh, and in review all these comments. Um, I think there were 220 comments submitted uh, for, before these proposed regs came out. God knows how many there will be now. Uh, if you want to get a comment in, you need to do it by uh, February 7. Um, let's see. Um, and as far as the effective date, they say in the proposed regs that they want to do it as soon as possible. Um, so it's not inconceivable that it could be sometime this year. Uh, but uh, it may take them some time to go through all the comments. So perhaps beginning of next year. Uh, so that is uh, basically uh, the main points uh, involving the regs. There's, there's a number of details, uh, but perhaps we should take questions or if Bill or Howard has any more comments, uh, feel free. Let's take some of the questions here, I see. Um, I, I got them out of the Q&A. It says, uh, this from James, as I'm a licensed professional fiduciary that often serves as a trustee or administrator of an estate that owns corporations and, and, and or LLCs. The question is, will we need to submit filings for these entities in our capacity for each? Well, it's the entities themselves that report, uh, but obviously they got to act through uh, uh, whoever is the, uh, the managers or officers of the company. Uh, but you, it seems like you would have reporting entities unless you meet one of the 23 uh, exceptions that uh, that Howard uh, uh, briefly described. So it's not on the um, uh, on the, the beneficial owner or the, or the or the party that controls the entities. They're they're uh, on the report, but the actual obligation is on the entity itself, uh, absent some exemption. But the trust is going to have to provide certain information to the reporting company to enable it to complete the reports. Right, and if any beneficial owner or company applicant uh, provides false information, they will be subject to these uh, civil and criminal penalties. It's not just the reporting company, it's also the individuals who can be subject to the penalty. Yeah, the fiduciary may be a, a, somebody that exercises substantial control. I would think that would be the case. So their name, uh, it would be on the report, presumably. And by the way, what's, what's reported to be clear is it's only in, it's individuals. So looking for the beneficial owners that ultimately are individuals, or they're looking for people that control, looking for persons that control that are individuals. So the individuals end up on the on the report, but the reporting entity is a, a reporting party is a, is an entity, a legal entity of some sort. Yeah, and, and notice also that um, the person who is signing these uh, beneficial ownership information reports. Uh, has to certify that they're complete and accurate. Yeah, now you've got an estate here. Uh, let's see. The estate would have to be settled before the beneficiaries of the estate would be um, substantial right. owners, for instance. Uh, but once the estate closes uh, or settled, which is what the language is in the regs, uh, then those persons could become, some of them could become substantial owners if they meet the 25% the uh, threshold or they control have substantial control over the entity. So there will be uh, an initial report uh, of the entity and then whoever controls the entity currently, which apparently is the administrator. And then when the estate settles, it's gonna be a change. There'll be another report it has to be done uh, within 30 days saying now we've got you know new substantial owners or new parties that control. <clears throat> so it's not, it's not gonna be uh, just one time and you're done. Um, okay, the next question is, uh, it's a question, I guess. So every closely held corporation or LLC owning a business or real estate must comply. 
Well, the, the regulations are after shell companies. So it's not whether they own anything at all, basically. Um, and if they want to meet one of the exceptions, they have to have activity, which is the 20 employees and the $5 million of, of gross receipts. So, so the answer is yes. Yeah, so Unless you meet an exemption. Yeah, so if this LLC, all LLCs I know, I've, and I uh, actually have studied you know, most of the LLC laws, they all require a, a plotting with, the, with an equivalent of a secretary of state, either a secretary of state in the, in the state or, or some equivalent. So they'll have to file, um, and uh, corporations for sure. That's a that's a, a vehicle of the state, you know, created by the, by state law. So those like are, California, you can have an association, and there's limited liability on associations if you follow the the uh, code, and there is no secretary of state filing. A business trust as well. You can have a common law business trust. That's a, that's a kind of association. That's that's true. So it's all it's a bright line of, of having to to file with something like a secretary of state, the secretary of state or something similar. If that doesn't occur, the entity is just not uh, reportable, a reporting entity. Uh, next, so if I have two corporations that form a general partnership. Yeah. Uh, the general, general partnership, partnership is not a reporting organization. Yeah. Now the corporations are themselves. Right. Uh, I mean, if you want to use that as a, as a way of, you know, how do you avoid all this, uh, assuming that that's lawful in itself, um, I mean, you could have general partnerships of individuals, they're not reportable, uh, common law business trusts of individuals, there are individuals with their beneficiaries and the, and the controlling parties, that would not be uh, reportable. Uh, Foreign entities that do not... Um engage in business that require registration, which would include shared appreciation mortgages? It depends on who the, what the registration is with. You know, if it's with the Secretary of State or some similar type. Right, no, I'm talking, you, you, ha you have a uh, Luxembourg finance company that makes a loan on US real estate and has a 20% equity kicker in it. And it has no other activities in the US. It's not required to file in California with Secretary of State or anybody. And it's not required to file in any state. So if it's in Luxembourg, it's a it's a, um, um, it's a it's a it's a foreign entity under foreign law. But then it's not required to, if, as you posit here, it's not required to register in any state in the United States. Uh, then it's not going to be a reporting a foreign reporting entity. That's correct. Um, so every so every. So, from Robert, so every time an ownership change, an entity needs occurs, I guess, needs to file a report. Well, it's not every ownership change. It has to be where there was a new substantial owner. So it's, substantial control. It has substantial control, yeah. Or a controlling party somehow, if you have some kind of document. Uh, um, but every change of an officer, every change of a director. A principal officer. Yeah. Well, the way they've defined officers, it's for, it's all officers. Yeah, all statutory good. officers. Well, there could be. Uh, well, they define what the officers are, so it's not it's not necessarily everyone. Yeah, not everyone. It's just they have substantial control, so you have to look at all the factors. Yeah, they have they have the treasurer, even have the secretary in there, which just usually keeps could just be taking minutes. So the definition of what's an officer is uh, fairly broad, but and it's also anybody who performs the duties that are similar to what these duties are, but they don't define what the duties are of a president, a treasurer, or, or secretary. Um, then it says, is the authority to enforce the new regs delegated to the IRS? Um, I guess we don't know that. That's what happened with the FBARs, but um, this is a FinCEN um, activity, in the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Uh, and they're issuing the regulations, but uh, uh, there's nothing in the, in the regulations of the statute that, that I saw that, that uh, provides for any delegation within the treasury to the IRS, which I guess is already overloaded with its own uh, uh, obligations, but uh, we don't know. Um, yeah, the regulations about who has access and how they get access is, uh, remains to be uh, seen. But obviously there'll be coordination 
because it's addressed to corruption and money laundering and uh, terrorist activity and tax evasion. But, but interestingly, things that you would have thought would have had access, for example, the LA County Assessor's Office wants to know about change in ownership, beneficial ownership of corporations and LLCs so that they could track if there's been a uh, triggering event to change revaluation. Unless they get a court order, they're not going to have access to that information. So if somebody improperly or failed to file a BE 100 when there was a change, um, Secretary of State has a good reason, I'm not Secretary, the assessor has a good reason, but they don't have legal access. Um, I, unlike some of the un, other money laundering rules where they have a concept of structuring, if you help somebody avoid uh, the law, the reports, uh, you're guilty of a crime in and of itself. There is nothing equivalent to that so far in this act. So if somebody comes to you and says, gee, could you help me find a way around it? There's nothing directly in the act that precludes it. However, you should be aware of a concept called a Klein conspiracy, where if you help somebody evade or avoid, including evasion, uh, the laws and trigger a, a problem with compliance, uh, you may have liability. There's a wonderful case called U.S. versus Popkin, where an attorney helped a client merely by forming a corporation, which the client was then going to use for some subterfuges. And the poor lawyer only got about $1,700 in fees out of it. Um, and he went to jail. So be wary of anybody who comes to you and says, how do I avoid this? I mean, you should ask why they want to avoid it. I guess that would be my, my question. Then. Well, but yet may have a legitimate reason. I, we've there been kidnappings in the family or threats of, of economic terrorism against us. And we want to keep it uh, low key. Well, that would be a legitimate reason. It may be a legitimate reason, but it's not, it's not an exemption under the law. Or if you're an attorney certifying the uh, uh, form on behalf of a client's entity, uh, you better be sure that it's complete and accurate. Uh, if, if you had reason to know that it might not be uh, accurate, you could be in jeopardy. Yeah. Let me go to the next one here. Uh, it says, I think one of you covered this, but in the, uh, in the case of a tiered entity, how far do we have to go up the chain Reporting purposes. Where so you, you go. get to the dead bodies at the end. Well, after you get to the individual, and then you look at the individual and do they own an undiluted 25% or more, or do they have substantial control, regardless of what number you come up with? Um, so yeah, you have to go up to the to the end, you know, whatever it is. And then when you get to trusts and things like that, uh, you know, beneficiaries of trust could be if they have a fixed interest or uh, vested interests, uh, then they could be substantial owners. So they have, there's discussion of that, not so much in the regs, but in the uh, preamble to the regs, which is 60 some pages of uh, discussion of, of, of um, the various decisions that the um, FinCEN lawyers took when they were putting together these regulations. So you do have to go all the way to the top. This is the next one here. Uh, if you or your firm have been practicing for decades, then how can you or your firm figure out all the entities that you or your firm may have formed? Well, the responsibility, I mean, that's one of our questions at the end here, so I might as well pick it up now. The responsibility is, is, is on the entity, uh, the reporting entity, uh, if, it's, if, it's a, if it's a reporting entity, so the legal entity, to determine whether it is a reporting entity or whether it meets one of the exceptions. Uh, in terms of the, of the lawyer's responsibility, um, I, I would think if you if you if you just if you're forming the entity, you would you would need to tell the client right away because you've only got that 14 days. So and I think it would be part of the incorporation or organization process. You're talking about ones that are mentioned here, which are ones you've done in the past. Uh, that's a question I have because we're looking at uh, let's just say, say hypothetically, you know, if you've been practicing you know, as you say for decades, you you probably got 500 maybe a thousand entities that you formed one way or another um, and uh, do you have a responsibility to go back and, and 
contact those people. If they're still your clients, uh, then I certainly would send them a, a notice. But what will happen is uh, apparently is that the, the Secretary of States of the various states will send notices to the entity. So if, you've, if they've had to register with the state, uh, they don't file annual or biannual statements of officers, things like that. So they should get a notice from the, uh, uh, from the Secretary of State of the, of the state where they're registered or, or were originally organized. Um, but uh, figuring it out, uh, you just have to go through the list and uh, pull up the, uh, you've got to electronically pull up the, uh, uh, the minute book and see what's what's involved and then if you have a current client list send them a, a, a brief notice about what this statute's about what these regulations are about i think you don't have to do the report um i mean they the regulations assume that the company's going to do it kind of internally uh, but that's the question about who who will be doing this will be the lawyer be doing it will the accountants pick this up as part of their work um, like it delegated within a within a um, organization to paralegals and clerks making this. And if the lawyer ends up picking it up, because this is a, a a form being filed with the government, the lawyers are treated often as a scrivener, and there may be no attorney-client privilege. So, got to be careful if you're going to end up getting involved doing them. Because you're asking about the structure, you're saying yes. And why the structure is put together, and you know what, what these are, what the substance is of the particular uh, device that might have been used to put the ownership structure together. Agreed. So, how many years do you think it'll be until they have a voluntary disclosure program for this thing? Because that's the next, uh, that's the next thing that happens, right? Two, three years down the line, now people have to come forward and atone for their mistakes of not complying. So that'll be interesting. I'm sorry, Mr. What's your question? What's up? There is. How many years do you think it'll take until there's a voluntary disclosure program for for these filings? Oh, oh. For the penalties. I think there's going to be massive uh, non-compliance. Most of it's not willful. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, I think the only way it's going to be uh, kind of resolved is we're going to have you know, as you say, all kinds of. Uh, uh, Going forward is going to be easy. Going back is going to be a lot tougher. Yeah. Uh, for example, there is no apparent public database of incorporators. I could find all the companies that I've ever been a, um, an agent for service on, but I, there is no list of those that I or my assistants have signed uh, as an incorporator or former. So it's going to be real tough to even figure out who these people are. Well, the proposed regs uh, refer a lot to the UK system, so I don't know if uh, they're going to be uh, trying to figure out how they manage to get all the information, although in the UK it's public information. Yeah. Uh, and the government's only talking about a relatively small budget, was it $30 million for the computer system and $30 million or something a year to operate? They're not going to be able to do an awful lot of, of tracking. Yeah. Unless this is, they not, I mean, that, this uh, is even larger than this is even more than F bars. This is every this is, I don't understand how they think they can oversee this whole thing. Uh, they're building a, a whole oversight. computer system. They're building a computer system specially for this. Yeah, but they're not going to do it on thirty million dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're waiting for the eighty billion <laughs> under the new legislation. If but it, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. You know, the new entities, like there'll probably be a high degree of compliance. You know, Parasec, Paracorp, all these professional organizations will just mm -hmm. be giving you the forms or giving you a notice. Right. Um, it, it's the older ones where it's going to be just failure to be aware of it, where there's going to be issues. Yeah, I mean, I have I have ones that I've, as I say, formed dec decades ago, literally, uh, and I haven't heard from them for decades. So I don't know what they even, if they even kept the, the minute book up to date because I don't keep the original minute books typically. I have a, a copy of it, and then uh, they go off, and sometimes they're back, you know, for two or three years, and then you don't hear from them anymore, you know, for various reasons. The company's become defunct or what? Who knows what? Uh, but you haven't heard from. Them. So, I mean, you can go through your client list, and uh, and from my client list, I don't have emails going back decades for sure. So I've got to write a letter, uh, and that's a you know 
If I've only got 12 months to do that, it's gonna be a little difficult and still do other work. Uh, it says, what if your paralegal who did it left the firm or, or died? Well, that's the company applicant. There's that one year rule. Uh, you just have to, re on the company report, you report the company uh, applicant, which is the paralegal who did the work and the attorney who, who directed the paralegal to register or organize the entity. Yeah, I'm sure they're much more interested in the uh, person who directed or controlled the person who filed it. Yeah, I mean, you may not, if the, the paralegal died uh, you know, literally decades ago, you may not have, you know, that person's even name it, but, but it's not required, it's more than a year. So you typically would have that. So we have anonymous. Uh, does, does an attorney have no report obligation with respect to an entity that the attorney represents, but neither the attorney nor the attorney's firm form? <clears throat> the attorney is not the reporting person, it's the, it's the company. Uh, but the company reports the uh, what they call the company applicant, which is the, the attorney who who actually organized the entity or directed its organization. Um, so it looks like you wouldn't have an obligation. Report, reporting company is a misnomer. It's the entity. Yeah, it's the entity. Yeah, yeah it's the entity. Uh, they call it reporting company. We have to stick by the definitions. Yeah, it says that no reporting obligation if the client signed the LP1 and the attorney prepared and submit. No, I just, well, again, the reporting obligation is would be on the entity, the LP1 and the LLC1, which are organizational documents for, filed with the Secretary of State to create the entities. Those cause those entities that are otherwise, if they're not otherwise exempt, to be reported entities. Then you report, you know, who was the so-called company applicant, you know, who caused these, these documents to be filed uh and in fact the client signed it but if the attorney then submits it then the attorney is going to be the company applicant so you you have to have the attorney the client sign it and actually submit it uh if you wanted to avoid being the company applicant sure so you send the client the form you say sign here you give them an envelope that's pre-addressed with a stamp on it you know are, are you in, in trouble or not I mean, this is going to get to be so ridiculous. Well, if you if you didn't watch your name on the, in this database in the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, that's how you would do it. And your picture. Otherwise, I don't see a way to do it because you could have the the client sign the articles of organization or the articles of incorporation, but if you file it, send it in, I think you're going to be a, a company applicant as well as the as, as well as the client. Him mm -hmm. or you know, I'm thinking of all these smaller entities that signed up with LegalZoom or use something like that and just really don't have particularly good records. I, I this just seems like an overwhelming, um, an overwhelming administrative disaster, to be honest. Remember in the 70s, the U.S. decided to tax foreign investment in U.S. real estate, FERPA. And since then, every real estate transaction is presumed to be involving a foreigner and every real estate sale ends up with a non-foreign affidavit. So these requirements where the government is worried about a very tiny, insignificant number of transactions suddenly becomes the tail wagging the dog. As here, where how many businesses are unlawful? This is what this is to track unlawful businesses. It's an insignificant number of the 30 million. And yet those are the ones who aren't going to report. Those are the ones whose pictures aren't showing up. And these regulations are ups, kind of upside down. Instead of providing uh, uh, exemptions for smaller companies, it does the exact opposite. It exempts so-called larger companies and the smaller companies are the ones that actually want to know, you know, who are the individuals that control them or, or have beneficial ownership. Um, and then the anonymous is, when does an attorney have no reporting obligation if there's a change in substantial control? Well, again, it's the reporting entity. The entity is the reporting entity. There's a change in substantial control, then the entity has the obligation. If the attorney is the one who caused the change, they did the documentation, then I think part of your obligation as an attorney in that they should have a very limited scope <laughs> engagement. Well, the obligation on the attorney is to inform the client of all of these changes. Yeah, I think if you're involved in the in the uh, in these rules. 
transaction, you have to tell the, uh, the, the, the client about it, you know, some kind of notice. You don't have to actually do the report unless you get authorization to do it. Uh, for example, does the attorney have to sign the formation? Do I, I don't think so. I think they just have to be uh, involved in directing the, the, the filing. You know, secretary to tell the to mail it, you know, and then you've directed it. Uh, let's see what's anonymous is still going on here. Uh, I know there's a question about who will have access, but do we know that they won't be publicly available? Thinking in, con thinking in the context of privacy for an LLC for entertainers. That's a good question. They're not supposed to be public, but the rules like you have with regard to tax information which are very severe for disclosures, do not apply here. As you saw earlier, you'll end up with a Teague investigation and Teague will try and figure out a way of plugging the leak. But no, th there's no big criminal uh, penalties for information leaking out. Well, they, they, they and do. The banks are gonna be the big source of the leaks because yeah. banks are gonna be able to get access to this information, banks, brokerages, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, to help with their KYC obligations. Yeah, it says here any person that that um, uh, that discloses the information, you know, which would be somebody in FinCEN or, or you know, if they, if they leak it, then they are, they're subject to criminal penalties as well. Um, but of course, you have to find out who that person is. I mean, we had that massive leak of what was it high net worth uh, individuals that had uh, that, that didn't pay tax because they didn't have an income, but they they had a big increase in net worth, and, that, and I don't know how many returns were, uh, or the informational returns was was disclosed. But um, uh, I think it's not going to be safe. Um, but there are safeguards in the in the statute and, and in the procedures to avoid disclosure. The European systems uh, have public disclosure um, in many cases. Um, but this system is, is not meant to have a public disclosure only for, uh, you know, government um, um, use. But they need the, the information to do their, do their job. Uh, we've got another question here. We have, I guess we're getting close on time oh, here. Bill, we're, we're like past the hour. So, um, I mean, maybe we can go another couple minutes, but I'm thinking we can wrap it up. And then if people have questions, they could reach out to the panelists on their own. But this was really informative and, and very helpful. And it'll be interesting to see how these rules unfold going forward. Um, I want to thank the panelists for their efforts and for the presentation is wonderful. Um, if you are interested in getting more involved in the tax section, we have our meeting on the third Thursday morning of the month at 8.30 in the morning. We would love to see you. If you have ideas for presentations, um, we'd like to hear about them. And next month, our February presentation will be on the new RMD rules. So stay tuned for more info on, on how to sign up for that. And I uh, wish everybody a wonderful rest of the day. And, and thank you so much for attending. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.